welcome to Prism of Value, where we talk about communication and how to express your value. Uh, and today I'm really excited to be joined by my guest, Gina Schaefer, who owns 13 hardware stores throughout the greater Washington region, better known as the DMV. And uh, she is an entrepreneur and is also uh, has a staff of uh, a team of between 250 and 300 people, depending on the season, and is very active in CCA Global um, and the nonprofit board of the IS, ILSR. And she can explain what that is in a little bit. Um, and I'm really happy to, in this part of our blog, we've been talking to people about how they have navigated through the pandemic, how they have uh, demonstrated their value to their customers as well as their teams, and just how they're, in general, they're going through it. And I met Gina at a Leadership Greater Washington networking event. And at that time, she talked about the number of keys that weren't being made this year. And that, and I kind of wanted to start that conversation, start our conversation with that. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what that told you about what was happening at the pand during the pandemic? Yeah, I have, um, thank you, Liz, for having me today. I have a couple funny examples like that. Keys are certainly one of them. So we measure um, how many of everything we sell, obviously. And we typically sell, um, well over 10,000 keys per store, so per location per year. And we noticed a very precipitous drop in the number of keys. And so to us, that meant people weren't uh, uh, sharing their keys with their friends, letting in perhaps new people they were dating, moms and dads coming to visit. Uh, they weren't making new copies for tenants. Um, Airbnb rentals were down. So uh, that's what that that's what that meant to us. Conversely, we also noticed um, a huge increase in things like SodaStream, the gas canister cartridges, mm -hmm. and then canning jars, for example, an explosion of sale of those two items uh, because people were staying at home and they were making their own bubbly water instead of going to the grocery store. They were canning the vegetables that they were growing on their back patio. Yeah. And so now as we're reopening, because I think your sales in some way kind of are an interesting barometer of how people are feeling. And so now as we're getting, when we, we spoke several months ago and it was kind of in the dark, dark times of, uh, of the pandemic where there wasn't the light at the end of the tunnel. What are you seeing now as people are thinking about reopening? And Well, you know, it's funny. We so we're in 13 locations, so we're seeing something almost different in every location, just in terms of whether sales are up or down versus last year. This time last year, I think people were panicked and they knew they were going to be stuck at home. And so we were seeing a lot of sales that had to do with backyards, with gardens in particular, the home improvement realm. Um, we're still seeing that this year, but I feel like it's more of an optimistic purchase. This year, I can have my friends over so we're still going to be in the backyard so i want my backyard to be pretty but my friends can come it's not just going to be me on zoom with my boss and my friends um, so we feel like it's a little more optimistic those sales haven't necessarily slowed down um, what we're waiting to see whether it happens or not is if people become so optimistic that they uh we don't want to work on our homes anymore because we can travel and we can go to mom's house and we can go to our friend's house um, and so we're waiting to see how that might affect uh, the sales further in the season. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so you started, uh, you purchased your first hardware store, I think in 2003? 2003, yes. Yeah. And so uh, tell us a little bit about how you started the company, why you started the company, and then some of the other challenges you faced in the almost 20 years since you've, you've had this company. Okay. Uh, I can't believe it's been almost 20 years. It still surprises me when I say that or hear people say it. It's crazy. So over the course of the last 18 or almost 20 years, we, and my husband is my business partner now. He joined me after I was in business for about three months. And so we've been uh, working together ever since. We have purchased four of our locations. We've closed a location, which is a topic for a whole other day. And we have um, built the rest from scratch. So in 2000. One, 2002, we started to watch what was happening in Logan Circle. That's where we lived. We'd moved to Logan Circle in the late 90s. 
And there was not a lot here. You know, it had been destroyed by the riots and the, the neighborhood was fairly dormant for decades. People started moving into Logan Circle from DuPont and, and other parts of town because there was just this sense of it coming back and coming alive. And I got laid off from my job and I thought the neighborhood needed a hardware store. So uh, fortunately, I found ACE. ACE is a cooperative. A lot of people don't know that, but ACE is a national purchasing cooperative. I contacted them and a couple other cooperatives at the time. I talked to ACE first. Um, and that's that's how we got started. It was uh, it was our first build, so it was a brand new project at the corner of 14th and P. Uh, the store was a disaster in, in the most wonderful ways. We joke about it now, but it had no elevator and no loading dock, but it was three levels, so there were tons of stairs. Uh, we ran up and down the stairs all day long. Uh, we lost lots of weight setting up that <laughs> store. Um, it was grandfathered in for no elevator. And uh, it was the, the, the rest, I guess, was history. So, yeah. yes. So over these, these years, you've probably faced a lot of ups and downs. Um, and how did that prepare you or did it prepare you for this last year? Well, I, I mean, nothing could have really prepared us, right? So... My husband likes to say that we never have a bad day. And what he means is that we can handle anything that gets thrown at us. And I like to believe him. So I'm going to say we've never had a bad day. I would say going into the pandemic, nothing truly prepared us for it. But mentally, uh, we hadn't you know, thought about being prepared for it. But things that we did leading up to it prepared us. And by that, I mean, we had created a really strong corporate culture. Um, we are never 100% perfect. There's always somebody who's frustrated or somebody who's quitting or getting fired. But at our base, we had created a culture based on core values and an open communication channel. Um, when the pandemic started and people started leaving, I mean, I have a friend who owns hardware stores in another part of the country and 45% of his staff quit. They wow. didn't feel safe. They didn't feel supported. Um, I, I imagine there were a whole host of other issues. I did not have anybody quit. And so I think leading up to it, if we did anything right that we wouldn't have known to give credit to at the time, I think we had created a very supportive work environment and a, and a, and a team that was ready to stay and, and jump in. I don't know. I mean, I might be really looking at rose colored through rose colored glasses, but we did not have that kind of mass exodus. We had people throughout the year who might have taken a leave of absence. Maybe the, the stress got to be too much for them. They wanted to take some time off. We were able to accommodate that, but we didn't see a big uh, drop off. Um, we also have always been very open with our managers being able to order what they need. So there's a whole ordering process. It's not you know, really, it's not an interesting conversation unless you want to geek out about retail, but they have always been empowered to hire who they need and buy what they need to take care of their customers. And so they already had that mindset. So for example, if people are coming in and they're buying crazy amounts of canning jars and the system hasn't caught up to that yet, I'm going to order a bunch of canning jars. So that's a simple example, but a lot of empowerment that had happened previously, I think, made it a lot easier to handle what was being thrown at us last year. Yeah. And yeah. so building a strong cult, corporate culture is really important. And how would you say that, what were sort of the fundamentals of that? You already spoke about one, which was empowering people to, to do what they do. But what would you say are some of the other fundamentals of that? The biggest one, the biggest tenet is trust. And that might sound a little cliche, but we realized in 2003 that we couldn't expand unless we trusted the people who were running our stores. I like to say that how could I have two or three or more newborns if I didn't trust someone to take care of the first one or two or three, for example? Um, I had to put employees in place who I believed were going to treat that store like their own. And so we started creating this foundation of trust. Um, I have almost zero turnover at the management level. And I like to think that's because they know they're trusted and, and they know what needs to be done. Again, something's always getting awry. I mean, we, I don't try to pretend that we're perfect. Um, but that, that foundation of trust was the first thing that kicked us off. And then, you know, even gangs have a culture. And that was kind of an eye-opening moment for me when I realized that as a young leader. Uh, people talk about corporate culture as, as if it's something that just happens. Well, it does happen, and it happens in a gang, meaning it can be very negative. It can be something that most of us don't want um, to live within. So you have to nurture it, and you have to talk about what that means. And, and for us... One of the big tenets was just being open 
and communicative. So we, um, we hire a lot of folks from the recovery community. I want someone who comes in who is, you know, six weeks clean from a drug addiction or alcohol addiction, for example, to know they can talk about it, to not feel like it's this big secret because there's no shame in any of that. And so we started again with that trust and that open communication in the very beginning um, and then built our culture around that. Sorry, so I'm babbling. A, no, you're not babbling at all. It sounds like you're allowing people to be who they are. They, it, it sounds like by allowing people to talk about who, who, where they've been and their experiences, especially in, in, in recovery, that they don't have to pretend, which is, which is really true in a lot of workplaces, that you have to pretend and hide who you are. And it sounds like that's not the case where for your, in your organization. We try to make sure it's not. We, we started last year um, with this concept of a, a stay interview. So maybe you've left a job in the past and, and you've had an exit interview and people say, well, why are you leaving? What did we do wrong while you were here? Or what could we have done better? But when do we ask people when they're still here, why they stay? And so we started this mm -hmm. concept and I, and they're not anonymous. We just, we, randomly pick 10 people every quarter or so. Um, and I want to know what the answers are. And we get a lot of really rich data from it. And I had a, a young woman one day say, um, we say, you know, why haven't you left? And uh, I, she said, I'm afraid to leave. Well, that prompted a really great conversation because I hadn't really thought about people fearing repercussion if they talk about leaving their job. You know, nobody, if you're wow. a really good employee, your boss might not want you to talk about leaving. They want you to stay. And so I had a really great conversation about her to make sure, you know, is it the culture? Do you think your manager is going to, will there be repercussions? Or are you just afraid to leave because you need some confidence and we need to talk about, you know, what kind of skills we can help you build so you can leave? Um, and so those kinds of open, let's, and, it's really important to me for people to feel that way when they're here. And again, always a learning, always a learning process for us. Um, I call it the telephone game across 13 locations because I might get it and, you know, stores one, two and three might get it. But then four, five and six, you know, the message goes through that wire and it might get complicated. So we have to talk about it all the time. And how do you make sure because a big part of this podcast is about communication and because we, you know, we believe that, um, most situations get worse. <laughs> you you end up with a lot of issues because there are these communications collisions or people not understanding. So what advice do you give to people about how do you manage that? You're trying to keep 250, 300 people informed at different levels. How do you make that work? I think that the, the most important thing for us to remember is exactly what you just said. Nobody ever hears things the exact same way, which to me means we have to say it sometimes 18 times, right? I mean, you might as a leader think I have said this over and over, everybody gets it. Sometimes I feel like I um, might be insulting my team's intelligence if I'm repeating something, but it's been proven over and over again that you have to say things different ways and, and at different times. So, you know, this is a, a, a little example, but internally we have an internal uh, like intranet, like our own Facebook for the internal. And then we have a newsletter and then we have bulletin boards in the break rooms and everything might be posted in all three places in a little bit of a different way. Um, and that's to make sure we reach people, whether it be about a new, a new rule that we have, some new procedure, um, a new contest, even the fun stuff we do. I often hear, oh, I didn't know that we had a contest about that, or I didn't know I could get a bonus for that. So um, we just can't assume that when we say it once, everyone's going to get it. Um, and we have to remember that you have to say things differently um, mm -hmm. for people to understand. Right, right. Yeah. And and do you use different modes of communication? I think there's a tendency in a lot of organizations. I sent the email, so oh, I'm done. Yeah. That right? was documented. Well, we get yeah. nine million emails a day, right? Um, yeah. So the leaders on my team, we meet uh, we meet in person. Well, now Zoom. Uh, once a month. And so we have a face to face meeting where things that have happened throughout the month um, are reiterated or, you know, we get a chance to talk about them. Uh, the managers all have uh, we all have each other on speed dial or text. And so we can communicate like that. Uh, and then the emails, of course, do go out. So those are probably our three biggest modes. I think I've been guilty of not using video. I think mm -hmm. sometimes visually presenting information is helpful for folks. And I have not cracked that nut. I, and that's all my fault. I've been asked to yeah. do it and I just haven't, but I think that would help a lot. 
it's coming. You know, it, you, can't me, do it, you, can't, you can't do everything, right? I, you can't do everything. Thank you. How, how do you ensure, though, um, that information flows? You know, you may share things with your managers. And is that part of their performance in a way that 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 that's part of how they're held accountable, that information flows? Because we hear this a lot in organizations that the information doesn't get distributed evenly. Yeah, I think um, it, that's true, right? I mean, if I have if I have a manager that's more that more often checks in with me, he or she's probably getting the information more often, right? But then I have some managers that they run the show and they don't check in, and if I'm not following up specifically, they might not think to call me. So um, I, that's not really getting to your to your question, but they the the managers are not held accountable for the communication flow. But they are held accountable for employee satisfaction. And I think mm-hmm. the two are married in a, in a way, right? right? So we do um, employee engagement surveys at least once a year. And if, if, they, um, if they don't get satisfactory results, there's a, a plan that gets immediately put into place so that they can do the employee engagement surveys again and get satisfactory okay. results or there are repercussions. Um, yeah. We do the stay interviews now. And so that, that also... That also helps. And then we can tell based on engagement a lot of times. If I have a store, I have one store, my store in Alexandria. If we do anything for that team, I get an email thanking me from every single person on the staff. And I used to tease the manager. I'm like, are you standing over them and making them write these thank you notes? But she has just instilled that when you're grateful for something, that's what you do. I never worry about that team being unhappy because I can just, I can tell by the, how the emails come in the sincerity, or, you know, if I go visit a store, I can tell by the sincerity of sincerity of the staff. Um, if I walk into a store and, and I'm ignored, I mean, if someone's going to ignore the boss, they're going to ignore everybody. Right. And I, I don't mean that to sound really cocky, but it's a good indication of what might be happening at the store. So yeah. That's, and that way the managers are held accountable. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, going back to the um, pandemic, um, you, were you, you were able to keep all your stores open during the pandemic? Yes. Tell us about yes. just how you navigated through and the decisions that you made, given you know all the regulations or the advice kept changing as as we learned more about the disease. Yeah, this time last year, I think things were changing almost daily, right? So we went from having um, in person monthly meetings to having a daily Zoom call, and then we moved to monthly. I think in we must have moved to weekly meetings probably by April, but prior to that, it was every morning. So every morning I would send out a fight song and that was some like pep <laughs> song for the whole team. Um, and then, you know, I asked the managers to send me suggestions and then we talked about how the rules might've changed. And so for a while masks were not mandatory. And so we talked about, do we require them? Can we, should we, then they are mandatory. How do we deal with customers that aren't willing to wear a mask? Um, what do we do about cleanliness standards? How do we handle all the extra product coming in? And so um, we were just on the fly making changes, but we were we were meeting via Zoom every day so that everybody had a chance to hear that the same information. By everybody, I mean the leaders, the 13 managers of the stores um, and their assistant managers if they uh, were able to log in too. We went to, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to be considered essential, but that didn't mean that it was easy. You know, I have this, well, we financially we did fine, but that doesn't mean that it was easy. And so sometimes I feel guilty saying one or the other. Um, we hired bouncers at some of our stores to monitor how many mm-hmm. people were coming in. Uh, we wanted to make sure that customers and employees felt safe in the store. And that meant limiting how many people could come in. Um, that was a very helpful thought when someone said, hey, maybe we should have someone at the door. I'm a little hardware store. Who has a door person at a hardware store? Uh, so we had to we, we worked on the fly a lot. Right. Yeah. Right. What would you say um, you've learned uh, from the experience of the pandemic that you'll take with you as you go forward? Are there lessons that you've learned, something that surprised you? Um, Well, as a business leader, again, never to be shocked, right? I mean, you can't anticipate stuff, but have some of these foundational elements in place. Um, We... Probably for me personally, you know, I moved, we opened in Logan Circle when a lot of it was boarded up and abandoned. And so for me personally, it was very emotionally um, upsetting to walk down the street and see businesses closing. I've always been a strong advocate for small businesses, but then to see my neighborhood that I had watched come back now recede 
was really um, sad for me. And I think personally, I wanted to make sure that if I wasn't doing enough to support local businesses before and advocate on their behalf, that I go into this next phase of my life doing that even more. Um, mm -hmm. what can we do? We, we started for about four months. We gave every employee $10 a day to buy lunch at a local business because we wanted to, at least wow. if that's all we could do, get a couple extra dollars into the hands of the, the local restaurants. Um, we worked really closely with a lot of the local streeteries to source products that they needed for their streeteries at discounts. And, um, I don't know if that's what I've learned, but that's a big part of what I'm taking away is, you know, really yeah. support the communities that we're in. Main Street is important. You know, I often tell people, close your eyes and think about a Main Street that you love. Maybe it's a place where you grew up or maybe it was a favorite vacation spot. Um, and then imagine it gone. And I think as consumers, as residents, we have the ability to shape that, that Main Street. Um, and I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to make sure that it's a, a pleasant place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so important, and and giving people, you know, some money to to buy lunch and support another business. I mean, that's that's a really great. That's a and and I I'm sure your employees appreciated that. that they as did. Well. They appreciate they appreciated a lot. It's funny the the first I think the first month everybody was eating at Popeyes, and I had to I sat in the room <laughs> and I said, all right, there are other restaurants. There's a probably a local person that owns that Popeyes, but let's go here and let's go here. And so that's oh, Gina, we just want Popeyes. Oh, that's so fun. Well, that chicken sandwich is pretty darn good. I, mean, that's exactly I, have, I have to say, I have to say that chicken sandwich is, is really, really good. Yes. Um, and is there anything that you now know, having kind of gone through this, this experience with, um, that you wish you'd known at the beginning of the pandemic that maybe you would have done things differently or, or not? I thought about this a lot. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? Besides the things that I said, anything that I wish I would have known. There were a lot of government regulations that came out throughout, specifically dealing with health insurance um, or mm. days off, leave, paid leave, things like that. And I do feel like we were sort of scrambling to stay on top of that. I don't think I could have known those things in advance, right. though. So I'm not sure. Um, that and supply chain issues. So we buy probably 90% of our, our products from ACE. Um, and there are tons of benefits for that. So we wouldn't want it any other way. But we had to pivot like a lot of other businesses and buy from other places. And so I wish I would have had some of those other places in my back pocket before I desperately needed them. Because by the time I needed them, everybody else knew they needed them. And then it didn't do me any good. So I don't think that really gets to the answer of, to, to your question. But um all of the things that just would make me a better business leader and us a better business in general. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, but it sounds like, and it's something uh, you know that I think about in in my business too, is making sure that you have the partnerships or that you have, you know, networks. That yes. you're always keeping those networks uh, because you don't know what's coming down the pike, and that you know. So I used to when people would approach me about you know certain video products or things like that, I said, "Well, I don't need that. Why? What?" But now I actually listen. Right. Because I don't know, I might need it. And at you least I should it. know about it. Right. Yeah. I should know about something. Yes. That, so ACE does a really nice, um, you know, neighborhoods do this too through the Main Street programs, but ACE um, lumps together the regional owners. And so we act as a really good support group for each other. And every once yeah. in a while, there's someone in that group that doesn't really play in the sandbox. They might want to hold something close to them, not share it. And for me, the, the concept of a cooperative is you're, you're cooperating with everybody. Um, and so having that network, no matter what business you're in, whether you're in a co-op or not, I think is really valuable because there's, I've learned from every business owner that I've talked to, whether we're in the same business line or not. So just having that network to fall back on, I think is, is really helpful. Yeah. Um, and at the beginning of this, when I introduced you, I talked about CCA and um, I'm not going to say it right. I S I L S R. I yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about those two organizations? And yeah, why sure. Important to you. Yeah. Um, so CCA Global is a um, very large cooperative, multi-billion-dollar cooperative. We have, uh, I think, 12 businesses under our umbrella. The most common that people may have heard of is the Carpet One Flooring and Home Stores. And so they operate, I mean, they're a lot like Ace Hardware Stores, but they're in the flooring business and it's been around for about 40 years. And so um, I serve on the corporate board of directors of that organization. Um, and then 
ILSR, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, is a national think tank that operates in several verticals, including small business, um, broadband issues, lack of in parts of the country, renewable energy, um, really does a lot of thought leadership, fantastic work for uh, lobbying on behalf of small businesses. Right now, uh, they're, we're working with the coalition um, to, to get some antitrust laws reinforced or re um, in, not imposed, sorry. There are antitrust laws that have been passed that are not being enforced. Mm -hmm. And so ILSR is working with a broader coalition of associations across the country to get those things enforced. And so um, I, I, I'm the, a business voice on that board. The people that work there are brilliant. I mean, they're fantastic writers and advocates, and I'm just, I'm happy to be on their coattails. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know that also a big part, and you, you referenced it earlier, is, is philanthropy and giving people a second chance. Yeah. Right. And, and, and that seems to be woven into your business. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? And yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it happened. It happened on accident. We happened to be right down the street from the Whitman Walker Drug Addiction Services Clinic, and in 2004, a, a guy named Shane came to work for me from there. And I, he and I joke now, like I didn't really care that he was in this program. I didn't need any employees, and so I said, I'm not going to hire you. Um, and he was just adamant. He kept coming back and working. And I paid him, you know, under the table. Don't tell anybody I just said that um, <laughs> for about six weeks until I said, OK, I'm going to hire you. And, and you know, 18 years later, we're great friends. He's getting ready to open a restaurant. Um, but he became a one man PR machine for me. And so he started telling his friends at the clinic to uh, go see the lady at the hardware store. She might give you a job. And, and that just turned into this pipeline that created a really wonderful partnership for us. Uh, and then we started working with an organization called Jubilee Jobs, similar similar um, uh, circumstances. Uh, and then one of my my teammates said that we were known as recovery hardware in the community, which was a really mm. uh, proud moment for me. And I think the cool part about that is, you know, when we opened Logan Circle, we we helped Logan Circle recover. Um, mm. I mean, that sounds like I'm tooting our own horn, but I mean we were there when the boards were coming off the windows, you know, we were selling the flappers and the light bulbs and the paint. And so um, people could come to us really close to where they lived. We didn't have to get in the, our car and go to the suburbs to buy hardware and go across town to buy hardware. Um, and so that a natural um, follow on to that was then, well, let's help the people in the community. And I didn't know this was going to happen, but these wonderful people started showing up for jobs and I had jobs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it became part of our, Part of our culture and do you feel in a sense that you're you're also part of the recovery that we're all experiencing um as we you know just something we talked about earlier in this conversation about now how you know, i'm going to gather and it's a more optimistic and you're sort of there with people i mean your hardware and is very much a part of people's lives isn't it it is. Um, it is. And it's very practical. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so it, you're it, about recovery and you're also part of this larger recovery that we're all experiencing. Well, now it goes back to, I'm glad you brought this up because now it goes back to my comment about the main street. And as we move into this next phase, this post, hopefully soon we can actually say post pandemic phase. Um, what, what can we all do as, as community members to make sure that our communities recover? Um, and it's, there's so much to that from the main street perspective. It can't just be the business owners hoping and fighting to make this happen. We need, we need people to shop in our stores and we need people to, to buy from us and, and we need people to dine with us um, and, and not just do that stuff with big, nameless, faceless entities. It's really important to us as small mom and pop, uh, locally owned businesses. So that's what we need to do. That's what I'm hoping happens in this mm -hmm. post-pandemic world. We remember yeah. that. And lastly, what are you most looking forward to? You know, are well, you going to take a trip? Are you going to, you know? <laughs> well, I, so I, I jokingly told somebody that I was going to walk down the street and start hugging random strangers. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, I had somebody this weekend shake my hand and I was so excited. Wow. That someone, and I, he reached out his hand. And I said, I'm going in. And I did. And I thought, wow, how weird is it that I think that it's strange to shake someone's hand? I am just looking forward to my team not being stressed about coming to work. Um, I, I know that, you know, now that with the new CDC, CDC guidelines, 
and the vaccination rates going up, I'm assuming the jurisdictions will follow suit. Baltimore, D.C. and Montgomery County have been pretty strict and we're glad for that. Um, so we'll wait until they start they start weighing in. But I'm looking forward to the day that when my back office team can come back in. My sales associates don't have a mask on. My cashiers don't have a mask on. Um, and that we don't have to police the customers doing that, too, because that's also a really uncomfortable position to be in. So that's probably. Sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Well, this has been a really great and rich conversation. Is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't think to ask you um, that you think is important? I think we've covered pretty much everything. No, I mean, I could talk about this for days and I could talk about hardware and we have 25,000 items. I tell everyone to geek out about something. And so, I, you know, I could invite you in to geek out about something or all of your listeners to come in and geek out about something. But I just appreciate the opportunity to tell our story and, and talk about how cool it is to own a hardware store. Yeah. And it sounds like it is. And, and you know, I, I think you ought to keep track of, or maybe you do, the geeky part, like what people are buying and what they're not and what that says about where we are as a community yeah. and sort of yeah. where people are going. Um, it'd be, a, it's a great barometer of, of life. Well, I can tell you that I'm selling about a thousand flower pots a month just from one vendor. So I think that really means that people are planting and they're making their, and this is the time of year when we do anyway, but I think because of the pandemic, probably even more buying beautiful flower pots and, and the flowers that we sell. So I think that's a that's a fun thing to look at in the heart of a business. And I love the analogy we're planting. So it's yes. very optimistic and very forward thinking. It is. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been a great conversation and um, I wish you uh, every success as you keep uh, Main Street alive. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a great afternoon. You too.